Hello again. In this video, we'll do the second part of chapter 15. If you remember when we left off um, the last video, we were talking about GLS, generalized least squares. And we did a heteroscedasticity example where we showed that if you start with a model where the assumptions are violated, in this case, the assumption that the variance is constant across observations, the variance of the error term, so, there, so there, you have heteroscedastic errors. If we know the model of that heteroscedasticity, we used a particular model of it, you can use that to transform the model in a way that gets rid of the problem. So GLS is a way of when you have some violation of the assumptions, it's a way of transforming the model so that um, the assumptions are satisfied again. So now we're going to do um, an autocorrelation example with these um, distributed lag models we've been working with. So the model we want to use is yt is beta 0 plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1 plus ut where, and we've seen this before, ut is phi 1 ut minus 1 plus et. This is often called rho, and I think when I uh, did the example empirical program, the do file for this, I, I think I used rho for this instead of phi. So just be aware of that. Rho and phi are the same thing. Okay, so the problem here is that our errors are correlated. We have serial correlation. They're not independent. And that's one of the assumptions that we need. So we need to find a way to transform the model to sort of isolate this e t term because this is IID. It has the right properties. It satisfies the, the necessary OLS properties. And so what can we do? Well, let's look at um, taking yt. We're sort of going to mimic this. If we move this to the other side, we'd isolate et. So let's try yt minus phi 1, yt minus 1. What would that equal? Well, that would be beta 0 plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1 plus ut minus phi 1 times beta 0 plus beta 1. Now this is lag, so we just lag these variables. xt minus 1 plus beta 2 xt minus 2 plus, oops, not a very good u there plus ut minus 1. And then what we want to do next is just rearrange the terms. So we can write this as, um, we want to leave this on this side, yt minus phi 1 times yt minus 1 equals 1 minus phi 1 times beta 0 plus beta 1 times xt minus phi 1 xt minus 1 plus beta 2 times xt minus 1 minus phi 1 xt minus 2 plus, and this is the term that makes it all work, ut minus phi 1 ut minus 1. Notice that this term here is just et. It's this minus this, leaving ET. So if we could run this regression, it would satisfy the OLS conditions. And so what we need to do is to somehow start with this original model, find an estimate of phi 1, and that'll allow us to put the model in this form. So what we do is we, do, we um, define the model in terms of what are called quasi-differences. And so the quasi-difference of yt is yt tilde equals yt minus phi yt minus 1. xt tilde is xt minus phi 1 x t minus 1. And this is just the lag of that. So that's just x tilde t minus 1 here. So we don't need to define that. You could x t 
tilde at t minus 1 is equal to x t minus 1 minus phi 1 x t minus 2. But you can just define, that's just the lag of this one. So we can define our model then in terms of those things. So we could write the model I just erased at the bottom here, you could write as yt tilde equals alpha naught plus beta 1 xt tilde plus beta 2 xt minus 1 tilde plus, and I just realized that I did something I didn't mean to do. I'm going to write u tilde t. I wrote earlier that ut was equal to phi 1 u t minus 1 plus e t. That's out of habit. Um, almost always use e t here. The book actually uses u bar t for this. Sorry about this. I'll switch to u bar now so it's the same as the book. So earlier I should have, instead of writing e t, I should have written u bar t to be consistent with the book. So this is just e t. We're just isolating this. This is that iid error term that we were trying to isolate. So sorry about that. OK. Um, so if we could do these transformations, and if we had an estimate of phi 1, we could. And we'll talk about how to get that estimate in a little while. We could run this regression. This alpha naught is equal to 1 minus phi 1 times beta naught. So you don't actually get beta naught from this regression, this quasi-difference regression. But you would get estimates of the beta 1 and beta 2, the dynamic multipliers, which is usually what you're interested in. You're not usually that interested in what the constant is anyway. But you can recover beta 0 if you know what phi 1 is or you have an estimate of it. You could just say, well, beta 0 here is just alpha 0 over 1 minus phi 1. When we estimate this, we'll get an estimate of alpha 0, and we'll have a way to get an estimate of phi 1. So you could get an estimate of beta 0 from this regression as well if you want to. But as I said, usually you're not that interested in, in the constant. OK. So that's really what GLS does. So this is the transformation that gives us white noise errors. It gets rid of the serial correlation problem in the error term. We just make these transformations. Then we can run this model, and it'll give us the betas, and they'll be efficient and consistent because we no longer have the um, serial correlation. Remember, if there are serially correlated errors, we still get consistent betas, but our standard errors are wrong. So you get wrong test statistics. Often what will happen with positive correlation is you'll get really big T statistics. It'll look like your model fits really well when in reality it's just a violation of the assumptions. That's all you're, you're really seeing there. OK, so that's a rough overview of, of GLS. Now there's actually another way to estimate these models the book talks about, and that's an ADL approach. I'm only going to talk about it briefly because I, it, it's not the approach that I think is best for a variety of reasons I'll talk about in a little while. But there's also an autoregressive distributed lag representation of this model. Um, if you go back and look at what we did earlier, we said yt minus phi 1, yt minus 1, I guess I'm going to write it again, is beta 0 plus beta 1, xt plus beta 2 x t minus 1 plus u t minus phi 1 times the lag, beta 0 plus beta 1 x t minus 1 plus beta 2 x t minus 2 plus u t minus 1. So we can go back to here and we can, we can, do, we can um, write this in a different way. So you could write, just after a tiny bit of algebra, that y t is phi 1 y t minus 1 plus beta naught times 1 minus phi 1 again, those two terms together, plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 minus phi 1, 
beta 1 x t minus 1 plus phi 1 beta 2 x t minus 2 plus u t minus phi 1 u t minus 1. And again, this is what I originally called E t, but this is u bar t. So we have the, the right error. So you could estimate this with OLS. You, you could write it as um, y t equals alpha naught plus phi 1 y t minus 1 plus delta naught plus delta 1 x t plus delta 2, I've got a plus delta 2 x t minus 2 plus u bar t. And this one up here was plus u bar t as well. Where alpha naught is um, just what it always is, beta naught times 1 minus phi 1. Delta naught is beta 1. I'm just writing these coefficients up here. Delta 1 is beta 2 minus phi 1, beta 1. And delta 2 is minus phi 1, beta 2. OK. So this is just another way to write the model. It gives us an IID error. So we could regress yt on yt minus 1 and xt in two lags. That would give us a, an alpha naught, a phi 1 hat. So we would get an estimate of phi 1 out of that. It would give you an estimate of alpha naught. You'd get beta 1 here. Then you'd have to use this estimate of phi 1 here to get and this estimate of B1 to get an estimate of B2 and so on. So you could work out what the estimates. Once you know phi1, you can get B2 here. When you know B2 and phi1, you can get B1 from here. And so you can get all the, the multipliers. The dy dynamic multipliers are the, are the Bs, the betas. That's what we're after. With this model, you have to kind of work hard to, to get them. You have to do all these calculations after the fact. And if I made this with more lags, and made the serial correlation, say, be um, instead of just having a phi 1, have a phi 1 to phi p, so that we have u t is phi 1, u t minus 1, plus dot, 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 plus phi p, u t minus p, plus u bar t. So if there's p lags, this would get really complicated. These formulas would get much more complicated. It would be a lot harder to untangle things. You'd, you'd, base, you'd have it just for the phi's, you'd have p of them for each equation. It would take. It would be hard to get them all out. You'd have p lags of y in the model, and you could get the fees out of those. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is this ADL representation is easy to estimate. You just do OLS on this. So that makes it really, really easy to estimate. What's hard, though, is, is you have to then back out all these dynamic multipliers, the betas. And that's usually more work than just using GLS. OK, but anyway, so that's the other representation. So there's the quasi-difference representation, the, the y tilde t equals alpha naught plus beta 1 x tilde t plus beta 2 x tilde t minus 1 plus u bar t. So there's the quasi-difference representation. Then we just looked at what I just erased was the ADL, yt was alpha naught plus phi 1 yt minus 1. Or I guess we called that delta naught. No, it was alpha naught. Plus delta naught xt plus delta 1 xt minus 1 plus delta 2 xt minus 2 plus u of rt. This one you can just do OLS. Here you can do OLS, but you have to do some work to get these quasi-differences, and we'll, we'll go through that next. So I'm mainly going to emphasize using this technique, as I've said. OK, before we look a little more at the quasi-difference model, let's talk about the assumptions that you need. So the Zero mean 
assumption for <coughs> excuse me <coughs> hmm. that's not exactly what you want to do on video but uh, I didn't really have any choice um, so the, the zero mean assumption for quasi differenced models so what it is in this case is you could call this utility, I think the book does, but it's basically that the expected value of u bar t given x tilde t, x tilde t minus 1, and so on is equal to 0. So you, you need what, what's obvious. You just need that, that u bar is independent of the x's not correlated with the x's. So it's the usual assumption, but it's a different regression model, so the assumption is a little bit different. Now, you can write this a little bit different. This is the expected value <coughs> of ut minus phi 1, ut minus 1, given x tilde t, x tilde t minus 1, and so on equals zero. Just substituting in for what, for what u bar is, it's that difference. That's why the book also, you could also call this utility because it's, it's basically a quasi difference. Well, it is, it's not basic. So this tells us that the condition is that the expected value of ut given x tilde t, x tilde t minus one, and so on minus phi 1 times the expected value of u t minus 1 given x tilde t, x tilde t minus 1, and so on, equals 0. So that the assumption is that that difference has to be 0. Okay, and I'm going to have to start up here, continue. So I'll leave the last line there for you. So, but for this to hold, for any minus 1, less than phi 1, less than 1, any, any phi 1 that's stationary, basically. Those are the admissible ones. Um, it, it must be that they're both 0. The only way this can hold for any phi in general, I mean, if it's 0 for phi equals 1 half, it won't be 0 for phi equals 1 quarter, and so it has to hold for any phi, and the only way it can is if both these are 0. So what the condition is, is the expected value of ut given x tilde t, x tilde t minus 1, equals the expected value of ut minus 1 given x tilde t, x tilde t minus 1, so on equals 0. So they're both 0. Now, let's forward this second one. So we're going to forward by one, forward one period. What this, it has to hold for all u, so it doesn't really matter what index we use. We're just using those for convenience. So the expected value of u t given x tilde t plus 1, x tilde t, x tilde t minus 1, and so on equals 0. So notice that this um, includes that. If ut is independent of, of all of these, including t plus 1, it's, it's going to be independent of, of these as well. So this is the only condition that we need for, for, the, for the model to hold. Um, but that's the same as if you look at these quasi differences. This is just t plus 1 and t. This is t and t minus 1. 
This is xt minus v1, xt minus 1. So this is really just saying the expected value of ut given xt plus 1, xt, xt minus 1 equals 0. But this is implied by strict exogeneity. So our assumption that we need, we can't do GLS unless we assume strict exogeneity. And that assumption is enough to ensure that this assumption holds which means our quasi-difference difference regression, we can do OLS, and it'll be consistent and efficient and so on. Um, it, it's exactly the same condition for the ADL model, and I am not going to go through it. Okay, now let's talk about how to estimate this model. So one way you can do these things is, is we're going to first look at something called infeasible GLS. It's infeasible because we assume phi 1 is known. So let's start off by just, we don't know what phi 1 is, but let's assume we did. Figure out how we'd solve the problem and then see if we can find some way of getting a consistent estimate of phi 1 that we can use to make this feasible. So the model is yt is beta 0 plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1 plus ut where ut is phi 1, ut minus 1, plus u bar t. Instead of writing et like I did before, hopefully I got that right. So with phi known, There's really just two steps. First, transform the model. As y tilde t equals yt minus phi 1, yt minus 1. We've really already done this. x tilde t is xt minus phi 1, xt minus 1. <coughs> And then to get the one for here, we'll just lag this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the second step is to estimate y tilde t equals alpha naught plus beta 1 x tilde t plus beta 2 x tilde t minus 1 plus u bar t. So if we only had an estimate of phi somewhere above here so we could do this step, it's easy. We can estimate this with OLS, and that'll give me beta naught hat equals alpha naught hat over 1 minus phi 1. Remember, that's known. And it'll give me beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat. And they're efficient and, and consistent. So that's a one-step procedure, but we don't have an estimate of phi 1. So how can, we, how can we do that? So now let's talk about feasible GLS. It's exactly the same procedure with a little bit up front to give us an estimate of phi, phi 1. So feasible GLS. All right. Here, this takes advantage of the fact 
that OLS is consistent estimator of the beta when there is serial correlation. It's the standard errors that are messed up, but the beta hats are still, um, they're still consistent. All right, step one of this procedure, and we'll point out where this comes in, is to do OLS on the original model. Yt equals beta naught plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1 plus ut. And that'll give us consistent beta hats. Beta naught hat, beta 1 hat, and beta 2 hat. The standard errors are wrong. But that's not going to hurt us. By the time we're done, we'll have the correct standard errors. We're not going to use the standard errors at this point. So we don't, but the betas are consistent. So we're going to do OLS on here. And then we're going to find u hat t equals yt minus beta naught hat minus beta 1 hat xt minus beta 2 hat xt t minus 1. Because these betas are consistent, this is a consistent estimate of the error term. And so we can use it um, on average. Or in large samples, it'll be correct. OK, step two then. Now that we have an estimate of the error, we can get an estimate of the fee, because we know what the model of, of the um, error is. So we're going to use OLS on ut hat equals phi 1 ut minus 1 hat plus ut bar. These are IID, so it satisfies all the assumptions we need for OLS. We have consistent estimates of, of, the, of the errors, so that's good. And this will give us, this gives phi 1 hat. So we have that estimate of phi we were after. So we run OLS on the original model, save the estimate errors, run the errors on lags, on the lagged error. That coefficient, that's the model of the, of the error term, gives us the um, estimate of, of phi 1. From here on, um, it's just like we did before. So step three is to form the quasi-differences. So yt tilde will be yt minus phi 1 hat yt minus 1. And x tilde t will be xt minus phi 1 hat x t minus 1. OK? And then finally, what do you think the last step is? Step 4. Run the quasi-difference regression. Y t is alpha naught plus beta 1 x t these should be tildes, t plus beta 2, x tilde t plus u bar t. And that's going to give us beta naught hat equals alpha naught hat over 1 minus phi 1 hat, beta 1 hat, and beta 2 hat. So we get our, our multipliers, our dynamic multipliers, directly out of this procedure. So OLS, save the errors, regress ut on ut minus 1, get an estimate of phi, use the phi to quasi-difference, 
run the quasi-difference regression. That's all there is to it. And these estimates will be, because this is IID, we used OLS. Um, we, this, this is an OLS regression. They're consistent and efficient. Now this is a one-step procedure. There's also a way to do this that's an iterative procedure. Now, there's no theoretical increase in efficiency or consistency. Um, there, I should just say efficiency. There's no theoretical increase in efficiency from this iterative technique, but it seems to help, and most of the time it's done. So now let's look at iterated. This is problem three on the empirical assignment. Iterated GLS. So we're going to take the procedure we just did and loop through it. And we'll keep getting new estimates of phi one each time. Then we'll stop when those estimates don't change by very much. We'll specify what that, what that tolerance is, what that convergence criteria is. So iterated GLS. Okay. It's just like before. So step one, do OLS on yt equals beta naught plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1. And hopefully um, plus ut, this is, this, this is not ut bar. This is the serially correlated one. Um, hopefully you can see how to extend this to more x's. You, you would just have more lags in your quasi-difference form, um, more lags in the x's. So you could have beta 3 xt minus 2 and all the way out to xt minus p. And it wouldn't really change anything that we've done, except you just have more lags. All right, so you do that. Then you save ut hat. I'm going to call it ut hat 1. I numbered these a little different in my empirical example. Let's call that ut hat 1. Second, just like before, do OLS on ut hat 1 equals phi 1 ut minus 1 hat 1 plus u bar t. And that'll give you phi 1 hat, phi 1, 1 hat, the first estimate of phi 1. Okay. Three, use phi one one hat to form the quasi differences. Presumably, I don't have to write that out at this point. And fourth, run the quasi difference regression. Do OLS. So you do y tilde t is alpha naught plus beta 1 x tilde t plus beta 2 x tilde t minus 1 plus u bar t. So this is just what we did before. So far, we haven't done anything else. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use these estimates of the betas to get a new estimate of the error term. Then we'll loop back to this step two. So the next step. So this is where we begin looping. This is, this is the one-step procedure. These, these are fully efficient, consistent. Now we're going to iterate. Um, so the next step, did I number them this way? Yeah, five, would be to, so this is going to give us beta naught hat one is alpha naught hat 1 over 1 minus phi 1 1 hat. We get an alpha naught hat when we run this regression. And we've got the phi 1 from up here, so we can get beta naught. And then here, we'll, we'll, we'll get beta 1 1 hat and beta 2 2 hat. Now, these betas are different than the betas up here in our original regression. Presumably, they're better because these are fully efficient and consistent. So presumably, these are better estimates. And so we're going to use these to form ut hat 2 is yt minus beta naught 1 hat minus beta 1 1 hat 
xt minus beta 2 hat xt minus 1. And then we just loop back to here. We'll run u hat t2 equals phi 1. When you, when you run these regressions, it's OK to include a constant. It won't change anything. Um, phi 1 u t minus 1, 2 hat plus u bar t. We just run this regression again with our new estimated errors. And this will give us phi 1 hat 2. And then you'll form the quasi differences. That's this step. Then run the quasi difference regression. That's this step. From the quasi difference regression, you'll get new betas. You can then get u hat 3, blah, 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 phi 1, 3 loop back, you keep going, and you would continue until the absolute value of, uh, say, phi j minus phi j minus 1. j is just whatever step you're on. is less than, in your homework, I did 0 0.001. Often they use 0 0.0001. But it just, you can choose that. And so you would continue until, um, basically until the fee converges, the estimate of fee converges. So you see how to do this? It's just an iterative procedure. So just like with that one step, OLS, save U hat, run U hat on its lag to get fee hat, form the quasi differences. Those are the zt minus phi 1 hat, zt minus 1, where z is x or y. Um, so you form the quasi difference, run the quasi difference regression, recover the betas, and there's this one little tricky part to get beta not hat. From the betas, get a new error, run this, get a new phi, see if it's close to the old phi, if it's close enough, if not, continue. New quasi differences, new quasi different regression, new betas, new u hats. Loop back, use the new u hats. You get a new phi. Check it against the old one to see if you're close enough to stop. If not, continue. And just do it until this criteria is met. So that would be the, the um, iterative GLS procedure. All right, we're getting there. So the efficiency of GLS. I've already talked about this, but let me just write it down. If xt is strictly exogenous, and our other assumptions hold, and the transformed errors u tilde t equals u t minus phi 1, u t minus 1. And the transformed errors are homoscedastic. So we don't have a heteroscedasticity problem. Uh, I lost my place there. Homoscedastic. GLS is the most efficient. linear estimator. There isn't one that's better, at least in large samples. And this is the one step GLS, not the cochrane orcut iterative. For iterative cochrane orcut GLS, there's no theoretical increase in efficiency
but it seems to help and is usually done. You can do Monte Carlo sorts of experiments where you choose the data yourself and you know its properties. You could compare these estimators and this usually seems, you, you can't show it theoretically, but it, it does seem to help. So, so usually people use the, the iterative GLS. Let's see. Let's, the next thing, last thing really, last big thing, is to generalize this to more, to a more general autoregressive error structure. So suppose that you had, um, say, yt equals beta naught plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1. And presumably, you can see how to extend this plus two, two more lags of x, plus ut, where this time ut is phi 1 ut minus 1 plus phi 2 ut minus 2 plus, plus phi p ut minus p plus u tilde t. So this really doesn't change much. So what feasible GLS would be in this case, you would first estimate that by OLS, and then save u hat t. Secondly, you want estimates of the fees, so do OLS of u hat t equals phi 1 u hat t minus 1 plus, plus phi p u t minus p hat these plus u tilde t. I think I called that u bar t earlier. Um, and this would give you phi 1 hat out to phi p hat. So this is the only thing that's really different so far. You just have to regress it on p lags of the same error. Three, the quasi differences are a little bit different. It'd be yt minus phi 1 hat, yt minus 1 minus phi 2 hat, yt minus 2 minus, minus phi p hat, yt minus p. So that's y tilde t, x tilde t would be the same. Oops. So three is the quasi differences, and y tilde t equals that, and x tilde t would be the same. It'd be xt minus phi one hat x t minus 1 minus phi 2 hat x t minus 2 all the way out to phi p hat x t minus p. And then the final step is to run the quasi-difference regression using OLS this thing. Y t tilde is alpha naught plus beta 1 x tilde t plus beta 2 x tilde t minus 1 plus u tilde t. The only thing here though is that alpha 0 will be a little bit different. It'll be 1 minus phi 1 minus phi 2 minus phi p times beta zero. But you have estimates of all those from here, from this step. And then you could iterate. That, that's the one step procedure. You could iterate for the Cochrane-Orcutt procedure as well. And presumably, you can see what you would do 
If I had a beta 3 x t minus 2, I would just get a beta 3 x t minus 2 here, tilde t minus 2, and so on. And so you can generalize this fairly easily, the, the procedures. The book also talks about the ADL model. Basically, it comes out to be really complicated, and the multipliers are hard to find. Th this gives us all of our dynamic multipliers directly, the beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, the impact and the interim multipliers that we need. And so um, it's just more straightforward. Um, if you have ARP errors, the case I just looked for, the assumption that you need is the expected value of ut given x t plus p, x t plus p minus 1, and so on equals 0. Somewhere there's an x t and x t minus 1 and all the way back. But again, this is implied by strict exogeneity. So we're OK on that. If you remember, when we looked at the assumptions for the um, quasi-different model earlier, this was just xt plus 1 because there was only one lag. When there's p lags, it has to be um, uncorrelated with the p future values for it to work. OK. And I guess that's it. So again, what we looked at were distributed lag models of the form yt equals beta 0 plus beta 1 xt plus beta 2 xt minus 1 plus beta r plus 1 xt minus r plus ut, where ut is autocorrelated. So this is the basic model. And we talked about beta 1 is what we call the impact multiplier. If we add all the betas up, that's the total multiplier. These ones in the middle are the interim multipliers. We can also do cumulative inter interim multipliers by adding up, say, through the fifth step or something like that. So we talked about all that. And say, well, there's two cases. There's the case of exogeneity, in which case you use OLS with robust errors for this model. The robust errors takes care of the autocorrelation problem. And if you can argue for strict exogeneity, which, which is, can often be hard to, to justify when you really think hard about these problems, like the case with the federal funds rate we talked about earlier. But in this case, you can either use OLS for the ADL representation, but it's hard to get the dynamic multipliers, which was the whole point of the chapter, or we can use GLS. In GLS, there's a one-step method, and there's an iterative procedure, or Cochrane or cut. And then we talked about the assumptions and a few other things that you need to make all this work. But that's essentially what we did in this chapter. So the only new estimation technique is this GLS part. So um, hope the empirical assignment goes well. I think this one's a little easier than the last one. I hope so, the last two even. So thanks.